Hello everyone and welcome to the Yorkshire Game podcast and episode 42 of this ongoing series and today I have a very special guest indeed. I'm going to be talking to George Nafziger and George, if you don't know, is a prolific author and uh, wargamer from the United States of America who has got a unbelievably wide selection of books that he has written and published and translated. And uh, you will probably know him best for his uh, Napoleonic works, uh, Napoleon's Invasion of Russia, Napoleon at Leipzig, Lutzen and Bautzen, Napoleon at Dresden, all absolute seminal works of uh, the period for Wargamers, and also for his series of Orders of Battle, which uh, we're all going to cover in the chat that's going to follow very shortly. As usual, there's a little bit of housekeeping before we get going on the main interview, and uh, I'd just like to say what a great response I had from the previous episode, speaking with Nick Schofield about... uh, British and Irish volunteers in the Papal States Army in the 1860s. And um, it was a very obscure topic, and uh, I wasn't sure how things would go, because it was the first time that I'd had a pure historian on who wasn't a war gamer. Uh, But the feedback was absolutely superb. Lots of people enjoyed it. Lots of people said... I knew nothing about the topic, but I, jo- I listened in because I'm a regular listener and they really enjoyed it. And, and it helps when Nick, uh, my guest, who was really engaging, really knowledgeable and uh, great to listen to. So uh, thanks, Nick, once again for doing that. And thanks for all the people who have so far listened to that episode. And if you haven't, give it a go. Uh, it, uh, it certainly is, I think, uh, a really good listen, and even though there's uh, very little wargaming topic in there at all. Last weekend, I went to the Salute show over here in the UK, which was uh, which was really nice. I, I, I got a press pass uh, for the Yorkshire Gamer, so uh, that was lovely, and uh, went along. I haven't been to Salute for nearly 20 years now, since it was in Olympia was the last time I went, and I had an absolutely fantastic day out. It was uh, busy, it was vibrant, there was lots of people around, I spoke to loads of people uh, from down south who I haven't met in person but I have uh, for example had on the podcast uh, or I've had contact with over the years. Um, Fraser VK von Ketteringham from episode 6. Dave Brown the rules writer. I had a good chat with him. He's going to come on the show later in the year which will be uh, great to see. And just so many people came up and just said that they loved the podcast and loved what I was doing Uh, and I just want to thank all those people who did. Andy, Friends of General Haig, um, he's been on my list to come on the podcast for since it began. So uh, it was good to catch up with him and apologise and say, you will get on one day, mate. I do, I promise. There's a couple of people like that. So uh, we've just, I've just got so many people uh, lined up to come on the podcast. I just can't fit everyone in, which at the end of the day is a good thing. So thank you to the organisers of Salute for letting me have a press pass. Uh, it was a fantastic show and I hope to be back next year. And I hope, fingers crossed, to bring a game down to London and uh, see you all down there again. I'll be at Partizan uh, in about a month's time as well, so I'll have a chat with people there. So, on to the uh, interview itself today, and uh, George Nafziger... I'll be amazed if uh, there are many people on here who don't know who George is. I'll be amazed that there aren't many people on here that haven't at least had one of his books or referenced one of his orders of battle. Um, He's uh, 74 years old now, as he was telling me, and um, he certainly has an amazing body of work. And uh, I am absolutely amazed that nobody else has spoken to him on a war game in all historical podcasts, considering the body of work that uh, he has. Uh, so uh, we had a great chat for a couple of hours. We had really bad uh, technical problems, technical issues with the recording, and it kept breaking up and it kept going out of sync. And um, it's uh, it's been very difficult to edit, and I hope it comes across as one continuous um 
interview and it's not too broken up for you but just in case you do notice the odd change here and there regular listeners especially will notice a couple of questions missing from the quiz uh, and that's just because I've had to cut some you know one two three minutes segments out just because it was you know I wasn't able to edit it back into the mix so just bear that in mind when you're listening to this but I think it's come through quite well and I was so glad to speak to George. He's uh, had such a, a positive impact on my hobby and my understanding of history that I so much wanted to do this and so much wanted to get it out. So sit back, get yourself a cup of tea and get ready for me and George Nafziger talking about history and wargaming. Without further ado, here's the interview. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the interview section of the Yorkshire Gamer podcast. And this is episode 42, and we're back on the other side of the pond again in the good old US of A. And today we have a very special guest. I honestly believe that most, if not all, of the people listening to this show will have at least one of my guest books on their bookshelf somewhere. Covering many periods of history, my guest is a prolific writer. His list of books is very extensive. In fact, the PDF he sent me had 14 pages of books. Titles like Napoleon at Leipzig, Lutzen and Bautzen and many, many more are essential readings on the topics covered. I remember reading through those extensive order of battles when I was younger, both in his books and available separately at the start of many of my own projects. I found them a perfect planner for most of my armies. In fact, when I looked in my Napoleon's Invasion of Russia book today, just before the interview, I still have pencil lines under the units I've painted. But as well as books and uh, orders of battle, my guest is no stranger to the War Games table either. It's a name you all will know and recognise, so I'm so pleased that he's come on and agreed to do the show. So, let's welcome my latest guest on the Yorkshire Gamer podcast and give a reap big welcome to George Nafziger. How are you doing, George? Fine, thank you. And you? I am superb, and all the better to talk to you. Uh, as I said in my introduction, you've been a uh, a pretty big influence over my hobby over the years, so many thanks for that before we get going. Well, you're very welcome. And have you ever, ever done anything like this before, George? Is this your first podcast? Uh, it's absolutely my first one. I think you said you weren't the best when it comes to um, computers and technology, but we managed to get there, didn't we? It took a little coordination, but yes, we did it. <laughs> well, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you made the effort, and thanks for that, George. That's brilliant. Um, well, the first thing that I do on these um, little uh, podcasts is I get my guests to uh, try and summarize um, their wargaming history in in four minutes. Now, um, I, I think you said you've got a bit of an extensive history, George. Well, being 74, I go back into the dark ages. Um, I was going to say, let's see what we can let's see what we can do in four minutes, and don't worry, we'll cover lots of, lots more detail uh, after that. So, when you're ready, George, off you go. All righty. Well, here's everybody. Get bored. Um, <laughs> in about 1965, I was introduced to Stratego and a couple of other board games. In 1967, I went to university and was introduced to Avalon Hills, and we wore out literally a, a copy of uh, Africa Corps by Avalon Hills, and we played Battle Bulge and a few others. Uh, I was commissioned in the United States Navy in 1971. The Vietnam War was going on, and my draft number was low enough that I was going to go one way or the other. Uh, I was stationed in San Diego, and while there, I met the gentleman that run Conflict Magazine. It was in its early stages, and I did play test a few games there. Uh, most of them have vanished into the woodwork. One has passed on, and one of them you may know, Dana Lombardi. Mm-hmm. My last year of active duty, I did four years of active duty, was in Chicago, and I met a gentleman named Ray Johnson who, along with another gentleman, Fred Vettmeyer, had written rules for Napoleonic miniature gaming. Ray wrote Frappe, and Fred wrote Column, Line, and Square. Ray had a very large collection of Hinton Hunts, and I started buying them and painting them. And uh, 
When I left active duty, I went to graduate school and there were a few war games fought on the floor of my apartment. <laughs> uh, and off to my first job and uh, I brought my hobby with me. Had a very large table in the basement of the house I rented. Moved to Akron, had another large table in the base, or the same table actually, and had some local gamers that I played with. Uh, in about 1979, I moved back to the Cincinnati area, which has been my home, hmm. and uh, again met a local group, and we started playing on the table in my basement. And my gaming pretty much has been in the Cincinnati area since, though I go to a number of war game conventions. Uh, I have not been in a game in one of those for many years now. I tend to be a little busy at my table and kind of, well, if you've ever spent a day working over a table selling uh, books yep. to war gamers, you know that come <laughs> dinner time, it's, it's time to eat and time to hit the sack. Now, I had the uh, unfortunate situation of being laid off when I was 52 and found only part-time work. Uh, I did have my own textbook business, but uh, a friend of mine got me lined up with part-time work with Northrop Grumman in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. I was a paid professional war gamer for the United States Army. Uh, wow. It's something called BCTP, Battle Command Training Program, and it was computerized. And um, I would sit at a computer for a week, uh, 12 hours a day having great fun beating up on the U.S. Army. And I say great fun because I, reti I retired from the Naval Reserves as a captain. So uh, in anyway, th there's a one story about that. Uh, I proceeded in one game to destroy the Striker Brigade in its first ex appearance in one of these exercises. And I called uh, the office that I was working out of and she, the woman I spoke to said, oh, they're all a Twitter over at BCTP. The Striker Brigade got wiped out. And I said, yeah, I, I said, yeah, I know I did it. Do they know it was a Navy Reserve captain that did it? And she said, oh, God, no, don't tell them. So, <laughs> so I think I oh, beat the four good. minutes there. Oh, yes. Well, that's fine. There's, there's so much there, George, so much there to talk about. Uh, and I think you, how far did we get? Did we get to the mid early 80s? Oh, uh, BCTP, that was in uh, 2002. Wow. And, so uh, we're, not, we're not too far then. We're not too far off. No. Uh, and as a side note, after that, uh, I got into another section of Northrop and was doing both the BCTP gaming and traveling to Africa where I trained UN peacekeeping troops. Uh, they needed French speakers and I speak pretty good French. Oh, superb. So going back onto your your, your, your four minutes there, Judge, you, you kind of started then with, with board games by the sound of it, with um, the, the North African game. Yes, but then again, at that time, there was no even vaguely organized miniature wargaming. I didn't encounter that until about 1975 when I was in Chicago. When you when you did, just tell us the story then of your of kind of your first interaction with figures and wargaming. Well, there was a hobby shop in Skokie, and I was living in Evanston, in the northern suburbs of Chicago, and there was a noticed posted there looking for war gamers and uh okay i've been in war gaming so i called up and it was ray johnson he lived in lake geneva wisconsin and um uh, that was a few minute drive from where i was living so i went up one weekend and he had a table in a room alongside his garage and there were hundreds if not several thousand lead figures laid out and a couple of three other fellows and I started rolling dice, and uh, the, the, it was downhill from there. Yeah. And do you remember what that first game was? Do you remember what period and battle? Oh, it was Napoleonic. Ray was purely Napoleonic, and uh, that's what started my interest in the Napoleonic Wars. I was going to say, is that where it came from? Um, did you, had you had you had an interest in in history? Um, growing up, was it a, you know something you studied at school with interest or, or a hobby? Uh, you need to understand that World War II wasn't too far past. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of memoirs coming out at that point. And uh, I was reading a, a great deal about the war. And then in 1963, 4, 5, we lived in France. My father worked for Procter, Procter & Gamble's Overseas Division. 
Mm. And uh, he was sent to Paris to move the soap factory from there to Amiens. So I lived in Paris for a year and then for three months around Amiens and then uh, four months in Montreux, Switzerland, where I attended a boarding school. Uh, and we traveled around and I was at this battlefield and that battlefield and crawled, walked through the halls of Fort Douaumont and Verdun and the chateau of this and the chateau of that. And uh, <laughs> I can remember driving up to Soissons and seeing the tunnels in the side of the hills for the Maginot line. And uh, when we drove yeah. into Germany, I could see the uh, ruins of uh, pillboxes that had been destroyed in the Siegfried line. And uh, I was a voracious reader and sitting in the middle of all that history made it far more real. But then um, in the U.S., my parents had taken us on vacations and I'd been to several battlefields in Vicksburg and Gettysburg and Chancellorsville and the others. So I, I was pretty well versed in history. And you just needed that spark of, of seeing that table and, and seeing the figures to uh, to introduce you into the hobby itself. Well, it's eye candy, if you know what yes. I mean. Yeah. And it's addictive. <laughs> Very true. Very true. And how, how long did it take from, from that first um, figure game for yourself to start collecting and, and painting uh, the figures that you'd seen on that table? Oh, it was just a matter of months. I was only in Chicago 10 months, and I don't believe that I met Ray in the first four or five, so it wasn't very long. And in fact, my interest in the Napoleonic and my writing spins out of that because I was finding uh, very little information on odds and ends of armies other than, say, the English and the French, and not even that much on the French. It was pretty slim. When I had, um, I had my first job after graduate school, I took vacation and went to France and hit Pierre Petitot and the Librairie de Cedre and a few others. And then I went to uh, Brussels and then to Germany to visit some relatives on my way to Vienna. And I did the same bookstore thing there. And I came back with a very heavy suitcase and um, my name on a lot of mailing lists. And I started buying books. Uh, by the way, I, I also speak German and Spanish. Not not as anywhere near as well as I speak French, but let's put it this way. Between a dictionary and patience, I can beat my way through anything. <laughs> well done. So it, it was downhill from there. Um it just it it became a major part of my life. Well, it must have been a it must have been a huge advantage um, compared to other people uh, sort of in the field to have that background in uh, other languages uh, to help you with with research, etc. Well, absolutely. Uh, for instance, you may be familiar with my work, Imperial Bayonets. Uh, mm, I went yes. through British, French, Prussian, Hessian, Saxon. Austrian, and even Russian drill regulations. And uh, I, I actually had a Xerox copy of one and a hardbound copy of another. And no, my Russian is non-existent. But the first manual I had was actually in French. It was actually in French. Uh, and the second one was nicely illustrated. And already having studied everybody else's maneuvers, I understood quite well what was going on. So uh, th there may be a few deficiencies in the Russian section of Imperial Bayonets for my lack of being able to read Russian. But I'm pretty much on the money from what I hear. And um, you've mentioned you mentioned during your chat sequence of moves, but you always seem to have uh, a gaming setup at home. Uh, is that has that been your main source of gaming? Um, having sort of friends around to your house to 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 game. Uh, let's put it this way: having a place where I could put the gaming table was one of the prerequisites of which house I rented or bought. Ah, good good skills. Okay, now. Uh, Gaming's different here from what I understand it is in England. We tend to have basements in our houses in the part of the country I live in. And a lot of people that are gamers have tables in their basements. And they can be pretty nice. good size. Mine mine was 8 by 24 feet. Ooh, so uh, we actually put on the Battle of Borodino at one point in my basement. Superb. But uh, that's a long time ago. And those figures are long gone. 
Did you ever? I know the I know it's very different in the states with club scenes, etc. But did you ever have a club, or was it always friends round at the house as as the main source of your gaming activities? Friends and uh, groups, and uh, I've been involved in several groups in the Cincinnati area over the years. Are any of those st- still going? Do you visit? Uh, no, I've kind of pulled away from it. <clears throat> Excuse me, kind of pulled away from it. Uh, I have become probably far more focused on uh, exploring and translating uh, French military history works. And that takes most of your time up. Yeah. Oh, I, I will break off once in a while for a game. But between COVID, which kind of destroyed the uh, gathering process, and uh, though, though that's pretty much a done deal here, uh, people's lives have intervened and in trips and sicknesses and whatever other else. The convention scene started up. Have you have you returned to conventions? You mentioned earlier on about um, working um, there, selling books, etc. Are, are you back in the convention swing of things? Oh yeah, I've been going to conventions since 1988, and uh, I've been in two so far this year, setting up my booth and flogging my wares shamelessly. And uh, nothing wrong with that. Well, I'll tell you what, in seven days, I will be packing up and leaving from having finished uh, selling my wares in Chicago and coming back home. Which which shows, which convention is that, George? That's Little Wars in Chicago. Actually, Napierville. It's named after H.G. Wells' book. And um, do you have a um a trailer or a, or a big vehicle to carry everything with you? I would imagine you've got a, a bit of stock. Oh, geez, yeah. Uh, I have a minivan, uh, and uh, it's probably it's more like a boat than a minivan, <laughs> uh, a, a Toyota Sienna. And uh, having done this for years, I've got it down to a science. And my packing cases are my display cases, and I put two layers of uh, display cases uh, in the back of the van and boxes of books and the, what do you want to call it, a truck? a dolly uh, device to uh, put them on and drag them into the showroom. And uh, it takes a while to set up, but in about 30 minutes, I can be packed up and out and gone. Is that, is that, is that experience, George? Is that, you you know what you're doing? Absolutely. (laughs) Good man. Good man. (laughs) And do you, do you ever get time to, um, to, to sort of look around the conventions and maybe try your hand at a game? Uh, well, try my hand at a game, not for many years. Uh, I'm a one man operation, so I'm manning the booth. And the only time I get away is to get a a snack or hit the loo. Yeah. But in in the past, was that something that you would do? Oh, it's been easily 20 years since I've been involved in a game at a convention. And is that, is that really because you, 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 you tied up with your, your stuff? Um, do you ever get chance to go as a visitor rather than as a, uh, a vendor uh <laughs> let's put it this way i'm cheap if i'm going to go i'm going to flog my wares right get you <laughs> i'm, I'm going to cover my costs and, and, and quite frankly and i don't know what hotel costs and such are in england but uh they they've taken a big jump here and uh you know when you're paying 150 dollars a night for a room and you can be spending another 40 or so for meals if you're lucky to keep it down that low, uh, that's a fairly great expense. And besides, I'm cheap. So you need to you you, you need to cover that. You, you, you say you're a cheap date, George. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> well, th- thank you for that. Well, um, um, we're going to talk um a lot about your books and stuff later on, but I've just got a, my copy here of uh, Napoleon's Invasion in Russia, uh, the uh, nineteen. 19- let me have a look in the front. I think it's going to be 1988 copyright. Uh, and um, on the back of that, on the dust jacket, George, is a is a picture of yourself looking very, very dapper in a in a in a uniform. Do you know the picture I'm talking about? Oh yes, I, I, I figured that would lend some credibility to the book since it was a military history. Yeah, well, it impressed me. It impressed me all those years ago, and still now. So, what, what's that? What's that uniform, George? And uh, you've got uh, some nice medals on there as well. Uh, well, it's that of a full commander. Uh, I was promoted once again after that to captain, which is the rank immediately below rear admiral. 
and the equivalent of a full colonel in the army. Uh, and you want to know the decorations? Oh, well, if you know them, George, that'd be brilliant. Okay, Joint Service Commendation Medal, Army Achievement Medal, Navy Achievement Medal, uh, Expert Marksman Rifle and Pistol, Armed Services, National Defense, uh, Arctic Service, uh, Meritorious Unit Commendation, Combat Action Ribbon. The Combat Action Ribbon, by the way, I earned in Vietnam. I did two tours there. And uh, anybody in the Marine Corps or the Navy, in the Marine Corps and the Navy being under the Secretary of the Navy, who is shot at, receives one of those for having been in combat. And we were in combat repeatedly. Yeah. Did you say the career, how long was your career in the military? I did four active and 21 in the reserves, and I retired in 1995. You mentioned that um, through through that and through your contacts, wargaming actually became a job so that's uh that's quite an interesting uh in, interesting area so just give us a bit of detail about how you fell into that and, and the sort of things that you were doing i had worked in the nuclear weapons production industry for 20 years and when mm. the evil empire went away bill clinton our president decided he wanted a peace dividend and that meant he decided to shut down large parts of our nuclear weapon production facilities so mm. And I got to say, when you can't count on the evil empire, who can you count on? I mean, gee whiz. Exactly. <laughs> so um, I started casting around for work. And uh, unfortunately, 9-11 occurred about that time, though I did have one job offer. It was in the aftermarket aircraft parts industry. And I decided maybe I didn't want to climb on that horse. Yeah. Um, I went into the textbook business. A friend of mine had been buying textbooks from schools, uh, high schools and elementary schools and selling them and doing quite well. So he set me up with an account and I started driving around to schools buying books, but it was very seasonal. Um, Another friend said, hey, there's something called BCTP here. I work there and they're looking for veterans. And if you're interested, it's computerized war gaming. And I said, oh, throw me in that briar patch. uh, If you know the reference to Uncle Remus. And um, I uh, was hired on and uh, would fly out to St. Louis and go out to Leavenworth and uh, sit at a computer and we played a game called CBS. That was the system. I don't know what it stood for. Uh, I ended up actually learning another one, JCATS, and don't ask me what that stands for either. But CBS was large scale. Um, It was a company was the smallest unit you would see and it would simply be an icon where jcats got down to individuals and uh i would get involved in three or four of these cbs games a year and uh it was great fun i was playing with a lot of veterans and these are people who had uh, a lot of military experience which they brought to the war game table quite frankly sometimes i don't think the army that was playing the other side had people that were either very knowledgeable or very interested. Uh, they did stupid things. They, they would give the same movement order to a whole bunch of units, and they'd be all stacked up in one position. And uh, in that particular instance, I was running a, an artillery brigade, and I spotted it in 120 DPICM later. The printout of casualties was 10 pages long. Wow. And uh, so it, let's put it this way. Sometimes they were not very challenging, but it was still, like I say, Navy beating up the Army, great fun. So were you, were you always, uh, your opponent was uh, serving serving officers or serving soldiers trying to learn? Was that the idea? For the most part, the exercises were a specific division uh, that had been tasked to go through these. It was part of their annual training, and we did it. Uh, nice. Now, in 2003, I believe it was, if I remember my dates correctly, uh, I was actually involved in the dry run of our invasion of Iraq. And uh, at that game, they were far more serious. Uh, I played the Iraqi command at Karbala Gap, and I lasted all about 10 minutes. And um, Quite frankly, then our people literally turned to insurgent warfare, ambushing convoys and such. And you'll never believe this. The general said, they'll never do that. 
<laughs> they learned their lesson on that one, didn't they? They but, did. Uh, they did. So what does BCTP stand for, George? Battle Command Training Program. It's changed its name now. It's something different, so you wouldn't find it if you tried to look it up. Would it be like um, a computer game that we would be looking at? Would you be looking at a screen that was a map and icons would be moving around the map, or would it be more of a narrative uh, printout thing? Uh, the former. Uh, icons moving around a computer screen. But understand, these were not flat screens. These were the cathode ray tube, foot and a half deep screens that were maybe yeah. a foot and a half by a foot and a half uh, screen. It was pretty primitive. Uh, in fact, it, it was an er early evolution. I suspect right now they're quite a bit more uh, sophisticated, uh, but I have not been involved with it since about 2004. Um, I remember when um, I did a bit of military stuff years ago, we, we would have like a, a proper sculpted terrain and there would be a sort of a camera on a jig that would move over the top of the terrain um to show you where you are and give um sort of viewpoints etc did you do anything like that never saw anything vaguely like that it was always just a flat screen with terrain levels uh, basically if you were looking at a map and you had the elevation levels on it so you wouldn't do like a sandbox game with with blocks or, or anything like that? No. It would all no, be computerized. Uh, yeah. But a nice job to have, especially especially when you're winning. Oh, yeah. And, and when I was training the UN peacekeeping troops in Africa, we brought with us a computerized system and used, it on, used the JCAT system, which would individual trucks and individual people. Uh, and we used that mostly to teach them uh, that uh, an order given isn't given until it had actually moved on the computer. Uh, the Africans had a talent for saying, uh, I gave the order, but nobody ever did anything. So we had the JCAT system there and they would uh, pass the command to their enlisted person who would be, or officer who would be sitting next to an American who would run the computer. And then we would send the icons off. And when it arrived, it arrived and, and the deed was done. And the uh, there was always a climactic battle where they uh, small scale, you know, three, four, five companies, battalion or two, uh, would have some sort of engagement at the end, and that was kind of the graduation step. And how did you find people um, over all your years of doing that? Um, how did officers and soldiers kind of relate to the real world when you know doing a game on a computer screen is one thing. Did you find that people got into it and, and tr treated it as a learning exercise or did people go, oh, this isn't the real thing? How did people react to well, it? Well, I don't think it was uh, written off like you describe it there as, oh, it's not real or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like I say, the purpose was to act as a device that would make sure that they gave the order and they had to wait for the length of time for the icon to physically move the distance to the uh, objective. Yeah. So it, it held them to a rigid schedule and made them actually sit out. So they didn't just, you'll excuse the old American Navy expression, pencil whip. In other words, just scribble it off and said, I did it. So uh, just moving on a little bit, George, you've, um, you've got many different books on many different periods. Um, is Napoleonics your favorite, um, or do, do you just flit around um, history uh, and enjoy all of it? Oh, well, Napoleonics was initially certainly my most in greatest interest, uh, but I've always had a very strong interest in World War II. Uh, at one point, I used to scratch, build, and convert armored vehicles one from uh, one from another to make this variant or that variant. Uh, and books in general, uh, I have found the French Bibliothèque Nationale something close to paradise. The number <laughs> spectrum of books that are there is just absolutely phenomenal. And it is accessible online. I can download all these things. Uh, our American Library of Congress probably has an equal collection, but they just are not accessible. Uh, and uh, I've downloaded everything from books on the Moorish invasion of Spain through Vietnam, 
uh, the conquest of Vietnam and uh, even, well, one World War II work, which the author didn't copyright. So that made it open yeah. season. Um, well, let's put it this way. Uh, I had the benefit of growing up two years in France and seeing it all firsthand where all these things had happened. So when I read about something, oh, I've been there. In fact, well, for that matter, I'm reading a book on the uh, Japanese invasion of Spain in uh, 1941, or Spain, Philippines in 1941. And I'm looking at the maps and I'm seeing Alangapo and Corregidor. And oh, I've been there and I've run the streets of Alangapo. In fact, I actually staggered up and down several of the streets in Alangapo. Uh, just that and the other. <laughs> Malinta Tunnel, I've been in it. Uh, so when you've been there and then you read about it, it makes a whole lot. It's just an incredible different thing. Um, you, you may take it for granted. I mean, in England, you can go to the battlefields and probably drive through them and not even aware sometimes that you're on them anymore. But um, yeah. from my perspective, uh, it, it was quite enlightening and a lot of fun. And, and, and make, reading all these books makes it far more real. There is a town in Belgium called Zutlu, and um, we had I'd gone over there with some friends. We were touring battlefields, and we were going to take a shortcut from Brussels to Eindhoven, and we got lost in Zutlu, and there were roadblocks, and this way and that way you couldn't go, and finally a kind couple let us out. But I'm looking at the map of the battle. Uh, I can't think of which one is Nime. No, no, no. Well, it's it's a, a, well here. This is where the Alzheimer's hits. Bottom line is it it's on a battlefield from the uh, War of the Austri Austrian Secession and the Spanish Secession. I think there were two wars fought, two battles fought in that general area, and I was on the battlefield and didn't even know it. So. Then when I translating the wars of Louis the Fourteenth or Louis the Fifteenth, I'm reading about it. Oh, damn! Yeah, I remember that. Uh, so, anyways, it, it's it's just a, it's a world of difference. Uh, for at least for me as a Yank, not being English, it, it's it's something quite different and new. Have you still got collection collections of figures, George? What um, what sort of collections have you got? I don't have a single figure. They're all gone. We downsized two years ago into a condominium. And uh, there wasn't room for a table or all the figures. And uh, I had been selling them off for quite a while. And, and is that it? There's nothing left? Nope. Wow. How, how, how do you feel about that? Is that okay? Or is there a tinge of sadness? Oh, I suppose there's a tinge of sadness, but let's just leave it at a tinge of sadness. Do you have, do you have friends who have collections that you could game at if you, if you, uh, if you so wished? I play with other people's toys these days, yes. Ah, excellent, excellent. Uh, at the end of this section, I like to talk to people about what I call the Venn diagram of wargaming, and that's just breaking people's personalities down into wargamer, painter, collector, and historian. So how do you see those pieces of that jigsaw puzzle fitting together? Which are the more prominent areas of uh, of your personality? Well, in 1999, I earned a PhD in military history, so I think that ought to answer that question pretty quickly. That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a big tick in that box. <laughs> uh, and even the library is now slowly being flogged off. I don't know. I, I enjoyed painting for years, and I've painted many thousands of figures. I, my Napoleonic collection at one point was 25,000 figures. Wow. Uh, and I had well over a thousand uh, tanks and uh, figures for World War II. And those, oh, and they even had about 150 uh, American Civil War ironclads and such. But uh, the ironclads were the last and they went a couple of years ago. Do you do social media at all, George? No. I avoid Facebook. No. I was on it two or three times. Uh, well, I had twice had a web, uh, a Facebook page. And uh, the second time was when I ran for political office. But the first time uh, I had friends and didn't know what I was doing and clicked on something and forwarded something somebody had sent me to everybody else. And I did not want to do that. And uh, I figured I'd get myself in a lot of trouble real quick. 
And also, quite frankly, a lot of people <laughs> sit there and yep. send pictures. And a lot of people send pictures of what they had for lunch. And quite frankly, I could care what somebody had for lunch. So uh, I found it tedious and boring yet dull. And uh, so I avoid uh, Facebook and Twitter and all of that business. Well, you have a, do you have a website for your orders of battle than the Nafziger collection? Yes, absolutely. It's nafzigercollection.com, and the name is spelled N as in Norman, A as in Andrew, F as in Frank, Z as in Zebra, I-G-E-R. And is, is, that some, is that something that you run, George? I run it, yes, uh, and that's where I sell yeah. my books. And uh, are all of your books on there, George, on that, um, on that website? Everything that I publish is on that website. Uh, there's something over 600 titles, but not all of them are my original work or anything like that. There may be a hundred books that people that are, that I have contracted with that have written books and I pay them royalties. Uh, there are a small number of books written in English that are out of copyright that I reprint. There are about a hundred original works by myself. And uh, then there's something over 300 books I've translated from French into English and for German books that I've translated into English. And um, it's, are your books still being printed by, I think it's Emperor's Press was one of them that you used to have a lot of dealings with um, for your Napoleonic stuff. Are they still in print? Uh, Emperor's Press is in an interesting situation and they're not handling any of my books anymore. Hellion... Uh, an English company you may know, has reprinted uh, the 1813, they, they reprinted the 1813 series, the 1814 series. Uh, I forget the publisher, Lionel Leventhal was the guy's name, who published uh, my three volumes on the German army in World War II. Uh, Presidio and some of the other uh, very big publishing houses they have things print on demand. My Invasion of Russia book is available as a paperback print on command, but it's not gone into another yeah. hardbound. The only uh, book that's gone into many editions is Imperial Bayonets. It's in eight editions, and there's one in Polish. And for those of you that like exotic languages, there's one in Chinese. Of course, I, I think the Chinese were looking for state secrets, so they uh, published it. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, no, no, no military secrets there. Well, that's good to hear. Good to. We don't want to get in, into any trouble, do we? No. Okay, so I'll um, I'll just draw a quick uh, line under this section of the podcast. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we should be back in a minute with our usual big game chat. <laughs> Okay, we are back with the second section, and uh, as regular listeners know, we always have a little 10-minute chat or so on uh, big games and uh, talk to our guests about their experience of uh, a larger game, to say the least. And and as we spoke to George earlier on, he's done uh, big stuff with the army and uh, big stuff at home. So uh, what what does a big game mean to you george as opposed to a skirmish game or a regular game how would you how would you define a big game well i have been in some tabletop games that did waterloo and bordino uh and if we're talking physical size the biggest game i ever saw was a battle of bordino at fort monroe virginia i believe it was and the table was, I think, 40 feet long by at least eight and maybe more wide. And I have no, many, wow. no idea how many thousands of figures were on that. Uh, big games, board games, Drang Nak Austin. I mean, that, that took the better part of a ping pong table to, to, to cover the maps <laughs> and the thousands of paper counters. So I guess uh, the, then those are much bigger than the, what I did at BCTP. I mean, we might have a couple of divisions in a BCTP game, on the, uh, one on either side. So those that that big that big game that you were talking about, George, were you 
a participant, an umpire, an organizer? What was your what was your role in the bigger games? Uh, in the Borodino at Fort Monroe, I was a witness. Uh, I did not get involved in it. I put on a Borodino in my basement, and that was on an 8 by 24 foot table. And I was a combatant there. And I have played Drang Nak Austin solo a couple of times. So my background in really big games. And do you tend to, what sort of role do you play in, in the games that you have played as a, um, a sort of a brigade or divisional level commander or, or a higher level? Oh, it's varied all over the countryside. Well, first, of all, I guess we got to start talking what period. And uh, a couple of divisions in a Napoleonic game at most, uh, but usually just a division. We'd have a fair number of people there, so we didn't have to worry about uh, one person having to run one side all by themselves. So as somebody who has studied and written and researched Napoleonic warfare, how how do you feel that we as war gamers um, replicate command structures and, and how that operates on the table? Oh, my. Well, let's put it this way. I've been in some games where you got to roll to see if your order gets there, and if it doesn't get there, it doesn't move. And I think that's very inaccurate because there would be initiative taken on the part of the local commander. So nobody would ever be out of command. Uh, I, I think that's a, uh, uh, a, a made-up problem by the game designer. In Napoleonics, let me share with you an observation and a story. People read mm. a few sources and they may, may have a general idea of the basics, but there are oddities. Um, I, I've read repeatedly comments in, in French texts where two cavalry regiments would be facing off and one would charge and the other would stand and receive the charge standing with a volley uh, of yeah. their carbines at a range of, I don't know, 20, 30 feet, uh, but before they, they actually collided. And um, so all the war game rules sit there and say, no, you can't do that. You just lose. It's automatic. But the more I thought about it, I, I wondered, why am I reading so many times that they've tried it and failed over a period of from 1792 to 1815? And they keep mm -hmm. trying it and it keeps failing. And I asked myself why. And then it dawned on me. The authors are writing about it because it's an exception. It didn't always fail. Indeed, it was often a very successful tactic. And they only wrote about the exceptions because everybody knew it was an, uh, uh, a good tactic. So there's a flaw in reading uh, things and, and assuming that you understand and I gained a greater depth of understanding of what went on, having read the mass of books that I have read. I mean, I have read stories about, oh, columns, striking lines of cavalry, not good. Uh, and that, yet again, uh, I read an account uh, on the, I think it was at Friedland, where the French rode up and fired their muskets and then caracoled around and basically chewed their way through some Russian lines. So it, it's it's not a simplistic thing. It, it, it takes a great deal of reading and study to truly understand. And um, I'm not going to mention a name, but there was a fellow, an Englishman, who wrote a set of rules back in around 1988 and 1990. And it was obvious to me that he'd never seen any of the drill regulations at best, he had read uh, the English translation of the regulation of 1791, the French regulation of 1791, and he'd not read it in very great detail, and his rules reflected things that, uh, no, that's wrong, that's wrong. And that's what prompted me to write Imperial Bayonets. It was originally written as an essay for a wargaming magazine called Empires, Eagles, and Lions, and it just grew from there. I was going to say, do you find a frustration yourself um, playing Napoleonic Wargaming with the research that you've done? Uh, yeah, I do find it sometimes frustrating because people have not read the depth 
and understand it as well as I do. And I'm not going to say that I know everything there is to know about it because I know there's stuff I don't know and don't understand. Uh, again, it's they wrote they the 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 authors wrote about the exceptions, not the the way it was done all the time, all every time, uh, because everybody knew what that was. But like I say, and this this ties back into my writing and such. Uh, English-speaking people, and I'm not talking about, I'm talking about Americans, actually, not not the English per se, uh, we're monoglots. We speak only one language, so we're trapped in reading English literature, and uh, we get that perspective and that side, and we never get into the other side uh, about how the Germans, the Prussians, the Hessians, the Saxons, the Bavarians, the Spanish, the French, all these other nations did things. And um, sometimes... Believe it or not, where I found some information regarding placing of artillery on hills behind your troops, not a good thing, was from a Spanish field manual where they talked about the wadding and such hitting the soldiers in front of them on the backs of the head and pissing them off. So you just have to get into the broad spectrum of the literature to get a good picture on what's going on. And and very few people that design rules have done that. Do you find a do you find a difference? Um in perspective from you know if you read a, an account in in german or an account from french is there is there always going to be a kind of a, a bias towards the country that the person comes from oh absolutely uh if you read the accounts of battle of maida by the english you get one perspective and then i happen to have been uh given an account by a french by the French commanding general, and I forget all those details. It's been too long, and it sounded quite different. So uh, yeah. every, everybody sings their own praises and uh, tells the world how wonderful they are, and, and sometimes they build up the other side to make him sound like, like uh, to make their victory greater by beating a, 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 a invincible general. Yes, or um, inflating the um, numbers on the other side is always one that I I quite like to see. Oh, and speaking of inflated numbers, that's why I put all the orders of battle in my books. Uh, yeah. Those books were literally designed for the war gamer. They're maps and orders of battle, and as much as I could provide detail on, if I knew how a battalion was formed, I would put that in there and, uh, well, well but but exaggerating the size of your enemy's army is always uh, an old trick to make yourself sound braver. <laughs> well, I'm I'm looking at the the Battle of Mentana in the um, Italian Risorgimento at the moment, and um, the one side says four thousand enemy, and the other side says twenty thousand enemy, and it's quite easy to work out which um, side the journalist was on when they wrote their piece. <laughs> Absolutely. That's quite an interesting perspective there, George. Um, and uh, what's, um, what was the, when you played in those big games, what did you enjoy most about them then? Oh, I don't know. I suppose rolling dice, screaming and yelling. I know. <laughs> did you enjoy the spectacle of, 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 the, of the figures as opposed to, say, a, um, a 2D map with counters? Oh, yes. Uh, miniature gaming is by far... Uh, more appealing to the eye. Computerized games or board gaming um, don't have the uh, beauty, the color, mm. and, and the three dimensions. And Napoleonic uniforms tend to be quite colorful. Or if you go back into the Seven Years' War or earlier, nowadays they're just pretty drab, green and brown. You think um, from uh, an educational point of view, um, for teaching history, maybe that wargaming could be um, better utilized. I had a friend here in Cincinnati who taught high school, and he had a wargaming club, and he would bring the figures and have his kids, the kids that wanted to get involved mm. with it in his class play the games after school, and I am quite certain he used it as a learning tool and. Uh, well, literally, it was Ray Johnson and his collection of lead figures that got me buying lead figures. It got me buying books to learn what was done and, and turned me into the uh, 
literary, whatever you want to call me, that I am today. <laughs> yeah, it, it's. Uh, I think I think it's uh, an excellent tool, and a lot of people learn through visualization and to see, as you said earlier on, those ranks of Napoleonic troops. It. it it, it stirs, well, obviously it stirred something in me and, and yourself, George, that um, has continued uh, all our lives. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Did you uh, did you get to enjoy painting your figures when you were doing it, or did it was it a chore? Well, I got it down to an industrial level, but I did enjoy <laughs> it because, well, I would paint two or 300 troops in a weekend. Wow. Uh, uh, well, uh, like I said, I tend to get things, it's the engineer in me. Um, just develop a system uh, of mass production. and uh, But it was very relaxing. I could purge my mind of all of the troubles and issues of the day and just focus on what I was doing. So it, it, we used to describe it as being ther very therapeutic. Mm. I think I think a lot of people would, would agree with that. And um, did you stick to one scale um, for, for your armies? Uh, my Napoleonic army was, were Hinton Hunts. They were called 25 millimeter, but they were smaller than the minifig 25. So I don't know what their real scale was. And mm. my, uh, World War II stuff was all 15 millimeter. And, uh, the ironclads were one six hundredth, I believe. So I got around, but I stayed in one scale for one period. I've never gotten into nor played any of the uh, 128th uh, bolt action games or anything like that. Well, we're 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 quite old school on this on this podcast. You'd be glad to know, George. We're we're um, a large scale 28 mil mostly uh, for the games that I do. How has war gaming developed during your time um, seeing it? Obviously, since those early days in the 1970s. Well, when I go to conventions. The uh, older generation, the geezers like myself, talk about the graying of the hobby, and, and I am quite gray. Uh, and uh, at 74, I, I am not the oldest. There are people in their 80s that are working the vendors areas uh, that have been in it forever. And But we've talked about the graying of the hobby, and there, there seem to be a fair number of people in the 40s and 50s, and some younger, and I mean teenage and 20s, but I have the impression that a very large <clears throat> number of the young are not getting into the hobby because A, they can do a war game on their cell smartphone or on their computer at home, and they don't have to spend the time painting uh, or reading anything. They just have to click and push and type a couple of letters on their keyboard and they're off to the races. Uh, and I don't see them being interested in doing what we did. So uh, the general gist of the graying of the hobby discussion is that we think it's going to be a smaller and smaller group that are involved in miniatures. It's not going to be what it was in its heyday back in the mm, early 90s. There does, there does always seem to be um, a period in most or in a lot of people's lives where they maybe do the hobby relatively intensively up until um, sort of late teens, early 20s, and then have a break while they have relationships and family, etc., and then come back um, later in life in the 40s and 50s. Um, is that something that you see reflected in the States? Uh, yeah, to a degree. Uh, I also think it's a matter of finances, uh, lead figures are not cheap anymore. And if you're just starting your career, uh, you better have a friend that's older and got a collection if you're going to play it. Uh, because that helps. Yeah, it, it, it gives you the toys to play with. But there's going to always be that itch to collect your own. But I've also noticed a big shift, and there are massive tournaments in some of the conventions I go of sci fi stuff. Uh, and that's all the result of a gentleman that I knew years ago named Duke Seyfried. Uh, he was a friend of Ray Johnson's, and that's where Ray got his lead figures, his uh, Hinton Hunts. And uh, Duke had been smitten by the, uh, oh, geez, Lord of the Rings series, started producing figures and got himself sued by the heirs uh, of the author of that series, whose name's evading me right now. And uh, But that... 
those figures were out there. And, uh, and then there was Lou Zaki, who I knew from Lake Geneva, the original Gen Con, and he came up with Dungeons and Dragons. So uh, that pulled a lot of the younger people away from historical wargaming. So I guess I've seen the evolution and the branching of the hobby in that sense. So you mentioned Duke. Uh, his name's come up a couple of times. Um, he was a bit of a showman, I believe. Oh, yeah. He, he and a hardball uh, salesman. He used to come to Historicons and have massive, beautiful uh, terrain laid out. It's hard to describe, but the, the, he would have... Board, uh, his terrain that would be sometimes a mountain a foot two feet high and uh just gorgeously done and uh well showman or huckster uh, uh, might be a better way to describe <laughs> he was a character to put it mildly and i'm not going to speak ill of the dead but uh, let's just say i had some interesting experiences with him and he was very very commercial no worries well thank you thank you very much for that george uh we'll take another short break in uh, the recording now and uh, we'll come back and, and we'll we'll see how we get on with our little yorkshire gamer quiz <laughs> Okay, it is the third part of the show, and uh, it's the quiz, as everyone will know who's listened before. And um, we'll see how we get through this, George, because um, some of it might not make much sense, but it's um, it's regionally biased towards Yorkshire, so that might give some clues to uh, some of the answers. Uh, are you ready to go? Yes. Excellent. So, uh, referring to Wargaming, George, would you uh, go big or go home? Oh, I'm up for a big game. Hey, good man. Good man. Good man. Now, you might not have heard of these, but contrast paints, George, do they, though, that mean anything to you? No, never heard of it. Uh, well, uh, that, that's good enough for me. The, 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 they're a new type of paint, which I think are uh, a bit of a gimmick, but don't, if you've not heard of them, don't worry. Well, I haven't painted a figure for 15 years. Ah, right. So, um, do you remember what type of paint brushes you used when you did um, paint? No, I didn't use any particular brand. I just liked fine hair brushes, ah, not nylon. Rude. Not nylon. Oh, the the uh, sable, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Excellent. So, um, ninety six figures, George. Would you consider that an army or a pipe block? Uh. Not a very big start. That's what I'd consider it. <laughs> That's what we like to hear. And uh, six by four table. Would you say that that was a big game or a small game, George? Small. Very small. small. Very small. Excellent. And um, when you're organizing a game, um, would you use a points-based army or would you go for an historical order of battle to set your forces up? Historical. Excellent. Uh, another painting one, George. You, have you come across wet palettes? No. No. How did you, how did you used to um, sort of mix your paint and have your paint... Um, you know, ready to go on the brush. Would you use a little palette or what would you use? Uh, I basically use the bottle, whatever was, you know, if it ah. was uh, brown or flesh or whatever other else, uh, I never used a palette or anything like that. Quite frankly, you waste paint that way. Oh, good thinking. Did you, so you dip the brush into the bottle itself? Yes. Ah. Oh, I like that. Now, like now that. for a very short while, I had an airbrush. Uh, oh, how did that go? How did that go? Well, I used that when I was painting 200 figures in a weekend, and I would, say, take French Napoleonic, and I would spray mm. paint them blue. And then I would paint in the details. That's how you could do that. Ah, I don't know. I like that. I like that. And that's how you got through so many figures? Yes. Ah, brilliant. Um. When you undercoated your figures or primed your figures, what undercoat did you use, black or white? Tended to use a flat gray. Flat gray? Oh, in between. I like that. I like that. 
Um, now, um, when you're coming to drink uh, a hot drink, uh, George, would you have uh, Yorkshire tea or or dirty mucky coffee? Well, despite 25 years in the Navy, I've only twice had coffee that actually lived up to its aroma. <laughs> One was in Ethiopia and the other was in Brazil. Uh, right. American, the American idea of coffee is unappealing to me, so I don't drink it. So does that answer your question? Uh, that's, that's very, very you. I, I thought coffee. Uh, I thought coffee was like uh, the American version of water. I thought everybody loved it. Uh, well, everybody but me. <laughs> is that bad? Is that bad coffee in the navy? Then was it? Oh, geez, not, service coffee was not good. Let's put it this way. There was a coffee pot in every compartment. Uh, yeah. Not the birthing compartments, but the working compartments and mess halls, of course. And uh, they cooked it for 12 or 15 hours straight before they served it. So oh, it, it never ooh. appealed. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Um, when, you, when you look at a, a War Games unit, um, if it's histor historically historically accurate, do you like the figures to be close together or or distanced apart? Well, I always put mine close together. Uh, yeah, that's what we like to. But use. but let's put it this way: we were using uh, an inch being thirty men width. Hmm. So uh, we we tend to do. Well, let's put it this way. A French infantry company, Napoleonic era, of 120 men. Well, that would be two inches in width. So, yeah, but that's a long time ago. A long time ago. I, I'm dredging my memory. Uh, so, but they... T if, if you're going to be representing a unit where they stood shoulder to shoulder, or elbow to elbow, they ought to look that way. If yeah, you're doing World like War II, that. if you're doing World War II, then spread them out. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. Uh, question 11. Um, would you choose to do a two-hour quick game or a whole weekend game? Well, it's probably always been a two, well, more like four hours. Uh, and I've never done a game where I've come back to it the next day. So have you, have you ever come across round dice, George? Spherical dice, like a <laughs> cannonball? No. Hex, uh, duodecahedrons, 20-sided die, as close as I come to that. Uh, right. We we um, we have a bit of a fun thing on here that we, we, we're trying to ban them because they you roll them and they, across the table and they just keep going forever. I've never seen one, but I, it sounds like no end of arguments to me. It, just, it sounds like it needs to be banned, doesn't it, George? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you like um, do you like old school sets of rules that have tables in them, like you know number of figures versus a factor, and you cross reference them? them? Do, do you like that, or do you like the more modern style where you just roll a dice and six, and you're dead? The latter. So, what um, what would your favourite set of rules of all time be? What would be the rule set that you enjoyed the most? Uh, I've played so many and never won constantly. I guess close to the, the closest to a game's rules that I have played constantly would probably be uh, Command Decision, which is a World War II set. I've played a fair amount of Johnny Reb. They're all right. But uh, I guess Command Decision. Did you, um, obviously, been uh, from America? Has ACW been something that you've you've done a lot of? It? No. When somebody else invited me to an ACW game, I would go, but uh, it's not been high on the uh, level number of games that I've played. What was the What was the chap called that did Johnny Reb? Oh, oh, geez, yeah, I I can't think of his name. I knew him. I met him on several t occasions at Historicon. Uh, his name evades me. Was it I'm John? Sorry. Was it John Hill? John Hill. Yes, yes, absolutely. Oh, right, yeah. So, um, I think sadly he's passed away. Recently, well, a few years ago, I think. Yes, quite a few. Oh. Ten or more. Yeah. Wow. 
Well, yeah, I didn't realise it was that long ago because we we play we played a lot of Johnny Reb here and, and enjoy it very much. Enjoy it very much. Would you allow somebody to have unpainted miniatures on the table? Oh, no. Or as the French would say, no. No. <laughs> Yet nine. Hende. Yeah, that's Tagalog, by the way. <laughs> uh, a very important question. Um, which is which is better, Yorkshire or, as we say over here, the other place over the hill, which is Lancashire? <laughs> Have you ever been to the UK, George? Oh, yeah. Uh, when I was living in Europe, we went over once, spent most of our time in London. Uh, when I got m- married, we went on our honeymoon. My wife and I went to London again. So, But that's been a long time ago. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. And the fact the Navy sent me there. I was in Greenock, Scotland. Wow. Uh, for a week and a half uh, in an exercise. Then I went up to Bodo, Norway. So the, I guess there are three times I've been to the UK. So was um, was Greenock wet and cold and windy? Uh, I was there in September, and the ground was so soggy, if you stepped on it, it went squish. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about, sounds about right. Well, thanks for, thanks for that, George. I'm going to give you a... Um, a an honorary 75% for that. We couldn't do all the questions, but uh, I think uh, you've done a, a damn good effort there. So thank you very much for that. Well, you're very welcome. It was a pleasure. And uh, the uh, the next part of the features section, um, we I do a thing called Room War Games Room 101. Are you familiar with um, the concept of Room 101? No. Um, so it, it's from George Orwell's book, 1984, and it's a it's a room where you kind of your deepest darkest fears are stored, um, and I kind of use it on the show to uh, let people um, consign a favourite pet hate of theirs from wargaming. Uh, into room 101 so we can lock the doors on it and they can forget about it so uh, have you have you got something that uh, over the years has um annoyed you a little bit about wargaming that maybe you'd like to see the back of well yeah that's the person who always whines and cries when he rolls a one and he needed to roll a six <laughs> and in fact, if I may at this point share a witticism with you, do you know what the fastest thing on earth is? Go on. Ah, it's a war gamer. He can go from wine to gloat in a roll of a die. <laughs> That's very true. Is it is this something that um you've seen over your over your years then, George? Oh yes. Yes. Uh uh, I have one acquaintance who uh, practically cries, and it just just gets very annoying. But anyway, <laughs> oh dear! Well, that's a that's a that's a nice one to add to our our little collection in our in our room one hundred and one. I do like that. Um, and uh, the final little bit we're going to um, do is is Desert Island War Game, and that's a Desert Island Discs is a is a. a British radio program um, on Radio 2 in the UK and uh, celebrities come on and uh, kind of select their favourite um, music for over the years to, to take with them on to a desert island. Um, so I've kind of converted it to this show. And um, so the first thing uh, you get to uh, take is a, is a desert island war game and it can be anything uh, any size, any number of figures or anything, um, just something that you've enjoyed or a particular game that you like that you'd, um, if you could only have one war game with you, what would you take? Well, it would probably be delving back into ancient history and the, the Avalon Hill game Africa core. And would that keep you busy for quite some time? Kept me busy for four years in college. <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a, that's a good uh, recommendation. Then it will certainly keep you busy uh, on the desert island. Um, and uh, other than a, a religious book of your choice, you you can take one book with you. What would what would you like to take? This is a very difficult question to answer. I, I have owned and read several thousand books over the years, and I had never read one book twice. Okay. 
Uh, so I, I'm afraid I would step away from a military history book or whatever and say that there's one book that I had started to read and put aside and then should pick up and start reading again, and that's the Bible. Excellent, excellent, excellent choice. And uh, finally, George, uh, is there a war games unit? It can be one you've owned or one that you've seen in a magazine or one that you you know of um, that you would uh, like to cherish as a... Me, it would be the Polish Guard Lancers of Napoleon I. Oh, did you uh, did you own those in uh, your previous uh, in your collection? Oh yes, um, and I take it they were uh, rather successful for you on occasion. Yes, yes, uh, they 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 did their <laughs> thing. Uh, let's put it this way: I thought about it, and I really was looking at it more from a historical perspective of what what uh, what unit I found uh, the most brilliant on the battlefield and uh, drag that down to the board game table or the war game table. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, a, a perfect choice. Perfect choice. We've had a few difficulties with the recording, um, but uh, we're going to soldier on, as they say, and um, we're going to move on now and, and just and chat for a little bit about your books and your writing, George. Um, so did you know from an earlier age that you were interested in writing? Is it something that came through at school? No, I, it was quite, quite the contrary. I was reading other people's books and I read one on a Napoleonic campaign and I said to myself, I can do better than that. And I broke out my Sears and Roebuck portable typewriter and promptly beat it to death, writing Napoleon's invasion of Russia. And, and other than essays written wow. in various school projects, that was my start. And uh, it was downhill from there. Quite frankly, I'm retired now, and uh, a lot of people go out and play golf or other things. Or they think they're going to play golf in their retirement. Personally, I suggest a good hobby, and I've got a productive one. And uh, I'm always exploring some new niche in history when I'm translating something from French or whatever. And uh, it's keeping my mind active and keeping me busy and off the streets. Well, not exactly off the streets, because I drive around. <laughs> Uh, the U.S. hitting East Coast shows and such, and again, s selling the books. And it's become a very uh, social thing for me because I enjoy meeting uh, the people that come and buy my books or people I've known for 20 or 30 years that have, have come by me at my booth. And uh, they want to see what's new, and I, I proudly display the latest uh, hack translation. And... Uh, <laughs> So it's what, what I do to busy myself in my retirement. So that, um, that first typewriter that you had, was that the, the old school one where you would slide it across and it had the ribbon on and it went straight onto the paper? Oh, yes. And I literally pounded it to death. And in fact, I have in, in the room next to me now three keyboards. Three because I keep wearing the letters off them. Oh, no. I mean, I've, li I've literally got <laughs> keyboards where you can't find various keys because you can't see the letter anymore. So have you gone through uh, all the various um, generations of like typewriters that would record a line at a time and you'd check it and print it and then onto like modern computers with word processors and things? Well, let's put it this way. I had manual and electric typewriters going through that process and the first time i encountered uh, a, a computer that would record something you typed uh, was when i was in chicago uh, i was the enlisting officer at the induction center there and they had cards uh, uh, had a uh, computers that into which you could slide a uh, well it was the same sort of recording material that you would see on a, a cd or whatever uh, the uh, ferrite compound, but you would slide this uh, eight by three inch card into a slot and it would record mm. on that and you could edit it and then print it out. And then I had an Osborne computer. 
uh, which was the, well, along with the Mac, one of the first personal computers you could get. I've never had a Macintosh or an Apple of any sort. Mm. Uh, and then I went through various versions of the IBM and IBM clones. And uh, that's what I use now. Windows, I've been through Windows 3, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3 on ad nauseum. And uh, I refuse to go to Windows 10. That's a step too far, is it? Uh, hey, every time they changed the version of Windows, they just moved things around. They went to the point where they changed the graphics on the back of the solitaire cards so that they made it different. <laughs> and they kept hiding. Yeah. You know, I would know where to find something in one version to do something, and they'd put it somewhere else, and I'd spend a month searching for it. So, pff, nope. And I don't think they've improved anything at all. But anyway, and one thing they did was when they stopped being able to uh, handle DOS, uh, and you were going to talk mm. about the Order of Battle collection, and I'm going to get to that now. Uh, that initially was done on the Osborne and on the IBM clones that I had in a DOS word processor called WordStar. And... Uh, when Windows went to, uh, geez, what was it, Vista or the one before that, it would no longer support. I could no longer use the software. I could still print out, but I couldn't use, but it, it, it just basically killed it. And I had five gigabytes of data, orders of battle typed out in an old word processor. And I wasn't going to convert them to a new word processor. And if I had, I'd have probably picked the wrong one because there were two at that point and Word was not the uh, one I was used to where I was working. So I'd have probably gone the other route and really had a horrible time. So I basically gave up the ghost and uh, found a home for the collection of Orders of Battle at the Command and General Staff College in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And uh, they were tickled to death to get them. And in fact, let me, let me take a side trip here. I went to mm. a uh, conference called Connections, professional wargaming conference that was in the Marine Corps uh, base at uh, Quantico, Virginia. Uh, and they have their war college there. And I wandered into the library and, and out of ego, punched my name in as author to see what they had. And they had a whole bunch of my personal publications, not Napoleon's Invasion or 1813 or whatever. And I went over to a librarian and asked, how did you get these? Because I've never sold those to you. And I'm the only source. I've, the, <laughs> yeah. the, there's no retail, very, very rarely have I had a retail outlet take anything. So it's not worth mentioning. And uh, they said, well, somebody probably donated them to us. And I said, okay, fine. I introduced myself and, and went back to the conference. And a few hours later, I was at the desk after the last lecture. And they said uh, that the, somebody in the library wanted to see me. My first reaction was, oh, God, I'm in trouble. What do I do now? <laughs> and I walk in. <laughs> And uh, introduced myself to the lady, and she fell all over herself, thanking me for having donated the Order of Battle collection to the Command and General Staff College, because the Marines, in writing their doc, their, the work that they did in the in the Marine Corps War College, were constantly coming to her and asking her for that information, and she'd found what I dumped on the uh, CGSC website, and. It was incredibly useful mm. to her, and it gave me a great sense of pride to be able to have done something that's helping train the next generation of uh, officers and generals in the American Army and the Navy and the Marine Corps and everything else. So anyway, we've diverted badly there. So where were we? No, that, that's fine. No, um, I just we. how did that Orders of Battle collection start then? Because it's... Uh, it's a humongous project, uh, as you say. There, it's a, it's absolutely massive. So, um, when where did the idea for doing it come from? And uh, it must have taken you forever. Well, let's put it this way: I am compuls I'm a compulsive collector, a and once the spark yeah. was lit, the fire was started. And I, I do not remember the name of the individual, but eons ago, when. Uh, I may or may not have been, no, I don't want, I wasn't selling my books of any shape or form at that point. Somebody wrote me and asked me if I had an order of battle for something. And uh, I said, I wrote him back and said, no, but that gave me the idea. 
And um, when I had an opportunity to go to any of the major libraries around the U.S., including the Library of Congress, I always went in with a pocket full of dimes and hit the Xerox machines. And uh, <laughs> I found the uh, National Archives here in Washington, D.C., and you could order microfilms. And they had orders of battle from the Germans and other stuff in World War II. And it was a phenomenal source. And it's from those orders of battle that the three volumes that I wrote on the German army uh, came from because the microfilms also had all the detailed structure. You may have seen the hieroglyphic system that the Germans used to represent all that. Well, I found yeah. all of it. Yeah. Uh, and all the KSTNs too. Uh, Kampfstach, uh, I don't know what you call them in England, but we call them tables of organization and equipment in English. Yeah. Uh, so all, all of that just started getting vacuumed up and literally vacuumed up. And I spent hours transcribing it, obviously. But again, I developed, as I talked about the engineer in me, some techniques for being able to put an order of battle together a whole lot faster by cutting and pasting the, the structure. Uh, so I would have a division with brigades and uh, the regiments. It would say infantry regiment, infantry regiment, infantry regiment. And I would cut and paste that and then fill in the numbers. So I, I wasn't typing regiment, 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 regiment 500 times. Uh, mm. And uh, like I said, I was, uh, Topsy said in uh, Gone with the Wind, it just growed. <laughs> It it certainly did, and you, you, if I remember correctly, it covered the whole span of history as well as World War Two and Napoleonic. There was all sorts of uh, I've seen English Civil War, I've seen Seven Years War. I've... Uh, it it started it started about sixteen twenty five and went through World War Two. Now, yeah. I had a few post World War Two, some Korean stuff, and a few other odds and mm. ends, Arab Israeli stuff. Very very little, and the problem was getting sources, documents, and stuff that wasn't classified. Mm. So, uh, I, I, and that's that's about the same time that uh, DOS started, stopped being supported by uh, Microsoft. So, anyway, that's where it ended. <laughs> and have you, uh, when, when was the last time that you did a, an order of battle for that collection then? Oh, geez. I used to go to war game conventions and drag the computer with me and the and the uh, dot matrix printer, and I had catalogs and I would give the catalogs out and I would print them out for people right there. Uh, in fact, in one instance, somebody said, "I want everything you got on World War II," and I tried to tell him, "You don't know what I've got there, bud." <laughs> <laughs> and I gave him four inches of paper. Uh, and I think yeah. I sucked his budget dry. And I tried repeatedly to tell him he better. But he insisted, okay. Uh, yeah. It's got to be sometime around, oh, 1998, 1999, sometime oh. in that frame. Uh, because I had uh, given the stuff to the Command and General Staff College before I started showing up at BCTP, and that was 2002. Because I've got my copy here of um, German Order of Battle, Panzers and Artillery, uh, Volume 1. Yeah. Um, and uh, the level of detail in there is is just absolutely amazing with the, um, you know, it tells you the numbers of light machine guns, the number of Pack 40s, the number of um, Panzer Mark 4s, Panzer Mark 2s, etc. in a unit. The level of detail is absolutely is absolutely amazing. Is that from, obviously, the record-keeping of the German army? Yeah, it was. And after World War II, uh, the victorious allies carted off the German archives. And I don't know where the – I think the original documents were sent back to Germany. But uh, mm. our national archives microfilmed them. And you used wow. to be able to get a microfilm for $25. Yeah. And uh, – um, I'm casting around looking this period and that period and the other period. In fact, I had three or four volumes uh, of the uh, catalog of all the stuff they had. And it's just overwhelming, uh, the amount of documentation. So at 25 bucks a reel, uh, I had a, a small portable microfilm reader. And I would sit at the microfilm reader and the computer keyboard in my lap, translating the German huh. into those... Uh, TONEs that your orders of battle that you saw, but uh, 
I also found th those are broader scale things. They only go down to the number of light machine guns, as you pointed out. Uh, I also found the TO and E's, the KSTNs, if you prefer, and uh, they would tell you what sidearm somebody carried and wow. who, who drove what truck. And all those are in the order of battle collection uh, that I gave to the Command and General Staff College and was selling shamelessly. Well, I think these are, this is um, war games heaven um, in terms of organizing armies and um, units, etc. cetera. Um, that level of detail is, is what's gold dust, if you like, for, for so many war games throughout the world. Well, it was written for that purpose. I was a war gamer, and I'm finding this stuff, and again, it's the language skills, uh, that nobody else had or knew or could read. So why not? I mean, I know a market when I see it. And being a war gamer yourself, you knew what people were looking for. Well, crazy people like me were looking for. <laughs> you did um, You did uh, orders of battle as well for other countries, it uh, in the order of battle collection, if you want, I mean, I might have the, uh, battle for the organization, the American army for the invasion of Okinawa or something like that. I wasn't a uh, particular, if I found an order of battle, in fact, I even had, I bought a Serbian dictionary so I could translate some Serbian orders of battle I once found. Wow. Yeah. That's, 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 that's amazing. And has somebody, um, done Russian as well? Well, yeah, I, I've got a gentleman that uh, I contracted with to publish his uh, Soviet orders of battle, and he had he got into the Russian archives when the Soviet Union fell, and uh, I produced a 24-volume set of the Soviet order of battle at the beginning of every month from June 1941 through August 1945. And it goes, it doesn't give the internal structure of the divisions, but it lists all of the independent units and, and to what brigade or whatever they were involved. And uh, another 12 volume set written by Charles Sharp gives you the structure and as it varied in all of the uh, Soviet divisions and such and brigades and so on. Basically, I have that data, but it's copyrighted by somebody else and I printed uh, under a contract with them. Well, it's a, it's an amazing collection of data that um, I highly recommend to anybody in in uh, interested in World War Two war game. And if you're trying to put together a, an army list or a, a a unit for a particular battle, uh, I can't think of anywhere else that's got that level of detail. Um, so, uh, and the the books are still around, Ali George, as well as the uh, the stuff on the on the website. Well. Uh, Hellion has reprinted the 1813 series. Uh, 1814, I think, is still in print. It was published by Hellion not too long ago. They printed Imperial Bayonets. It's still in print. Napoleon's Invasion of Russia. Several. There's been a consolidation of book companies. It was published by Presidio to begin with, and they were bought out. And I think it's Rowan and Littlefield that produces it now, but it's print on demand. But if you go to Amazon, you can you type my last name in and you'll find the hardbound books. The one that I'm not sure what's happened to is my book on the Muslim Islamic war, uh, his military history from Muhammad to uh, right up before uh, our invasion of Iraq. And uh, you can still find it used, but uh, I don't think it's been reprinted. Because mm. the, the orders of battle came out initially as like a um printed pamphlet um and then they came out as a hardback uh, book through greenhill um over here in the uk um are they still kicking around i think they're out of business uh lionel right, okay. leventhal was happy to publish the first two volumes but the third volume on the ss and the foreign troops he did not want to handle mm -hmm. and i think casemate carried that and I think Lionel died, and I'm not sure what happened to the company. It was run by his son for a while, and uh, I've lost track of them. And in fact, I've wondered uh -huh. if Hillion might not be interested okay. in publishing um, the uh, three volumes on the Germans again. Never approach them. Well, I might, I'll mention it to him next time I see them. <laughs> 
Well, I could write Duncan myself, but go ahead if you want. It, it, it means more of the customer uh, saying, hey, would you reprint these? <laughs> than me saying, hey, how about you reprint them? I'm sure there's, uh, there's normally a couple of thousand people listen to this, George. So um, I'm sure if... Uh, 10% of those uh, wrote to Helion and asked for a, a reprint. We'd, we'd get somewhere. Well, I'd hope so. Anyway, they were they were quite something. It was an interesting effort. And, and by the way, sp what spun out of that also was I have a similar one I published on the French Army before uh, world uh, the, the pre-French inv pre-invasion of France, French Army, heavily, and then after that, and the, the, the free French afterwards, and then mm. one on the Bulgarians and the Romanians using German intelligence documentation. So th those microfilms were wonderful sources. Wow. Wow. Fantastic stuff. Um, just um, when, when you came to write your, your kind of other books, um, the more narrative books, did you decide on a style of writing? Um, did you try to go for academic or readable? How did you set about what was your mindset when you were writing them well let me give you some history of that when i was putting napoleon's invasion of russian together uh the manuscript as it stands now as you see it was 700 typewritten pages with all the orders of battle in it but i had been looking to add to the appendices the internal structure mm. of all of the uh regiments russian french prussian and all the little german states and such and I had gathered that data. I had even gotten into the uh, Anne S. K. Brown collection at Brown University, and they had a massive number of regimental histories. And uh, me and my pocket full of dimes went to work. And um, I found that not only did I have all that structure for 1812, but I had it from 1792 to 1815. So I wrote a series of books on the internal structures of all of these various armies of the Napoleonic Wars. And the only ones I don't have are the Austrians or the Northern Italians or the Neapolitans. Uh, but um, those are, they're, 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 if you want to say academic, uh, borderline. I mean, there, there's a bibliography and the, the data is accurate from the, uh, from the field of the uh, regimental histories and such that I found but they're not footnoted. Uh, I mm. went to a uh, French revolutionary conference uh, shortly after 1812 came out and had some PhD twit candidate criticize me for not being academic because I didn't have footnotes uh, in my work. So I have subsequently gone to footnoting things, but the footnotes are there mm. only to shut up the academic twits uh, and uh, not to... Uh, <laughs> Not to impress the people that are reading it, I let the data do that for itself. But when you say academic, you know, like I say, the, 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 there's the, the dissertation sort of thing, and then there's the the narrative history, and uh, I, I guess I go to the uh, narrative history. Yeah, because I've I've always found your books um, quite readable. I'm not I'm not suggesting that the novels, but sometimes you read. Uh, uh you know an historical reference book and, and it comes across as a reference book quite dry and you know like you're reading a chemistry or a physics textbook whereas i always found your um books in inverted commas readable and i wondered whether you'd you'd kind of decided to do that um deliberately or whether it was just your natural style of uh, writing oh i'd say it's the natural style it's the way i talk yeah because i'm sure you've read books in the past where you, you've fallen asleep after a couple of pages yeah but they're either accounting or macroeconomics <laughs> neither neither very interesting subjects <laughs> yeah right up there with uh cures for insomnia but uh yeah, exactly so Na napoleon's invasion of russia then i didn't realize did you say that was your first book yes that that's a uh, that <laughs> That's kind of a, a big leap, isn't it? Right, um, a big subject. Um, were you not daunted when you started that? Mm, oh no, uh -uh. I just kind of laid out in my mind what I wanted to do, and uh, I felt like I believe the first chapter or two, one of the first two, I haven't looked at it for quite a while, is explaining why the invasion occurred 
and mm. then I talk about the preparations, and then I talk about the many chapters on the process of it and how it ended. Uh, and it just kind of flowed. Yeah, follow follow the history and um, as a story, uh, and it and it reads quite well because the history, the narrative of the history is already there, isn't it? Yeah, you managed to get uh, David Chandler to do the forward in 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 the one I've got. How did that come about? Oh well, that wasn't me. That was Presidio Press. They contacted him. I had never had any contact with Chandler, although I knew of him. Uh, I had no. I think I still have it. Uh, his campaigns of Napoleon that my father had bought my grandfather. And mm. uh, when my grandfather passed, my father inherited it. When he passed, I inherited it. And uh, it's kind of been passed down. Uh, so I knew of him. And I didn't meet him until about the year 2000. I went to a conference uh, in Alessandria, Italy. And uh, I mean, he was there. And I met him then. Just the one time. He was uh, quite complimentary in uh, in the forward. Uh, was he? Uh, I mean, I've never met him myself. Uh, was he? A, was he a nice chap? Oh, nice enough. Uh, when I met him, look, I, I was quite a bit further down the academic road, so my <laughs> yeah. relationship with him would have been probably different had it been. Here's my first book. Write the forward, uh, yeah. and. Uh, so it was on a different basis. Uh, I don't know. You know, at that point, I had my PhD. At that point, I was a retired Navy captain. Uh, and I had a whole line of books behind me. So let's just say we were, at that point, more or less peers, if I may. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. And um, many of your books um, are... Napoleon based um, you know, from that perspective what's your what's your thoughts on Napoleon where where do you put him in in the sort of the, the annals of history of the great generals well among the French generals he was probably the greatest uh, although Turin and de Say uh, were, were certainly noteworthy, and uh, but Napoleon learned from them. He followed them, uh, and uh, I would say he had a great impact on the way wars were fought. He changed it. Uh, he abandoned the old process of, uh, well, look, logistics is the basis for warfare. And I suppose I could drivel on about this for some time, but he developed a new process of logistics. The old process that had been used during the Seven Years' War and such required that you besiege this fort and that fort and clear the enemy out from your rear so you could bring your supplies up. During the Revolution, they evolved their foraging process, and Napoleon not only brought it to a fine art, or under his auspices, he came to a fine art. He supplemented it because he instituted the first militarized logistical system. And here I'm going to drop some interesting historical tidbits on you. Uh, do you know why we have canned food today? Do you know why we have canned food no. today? Napoleon. In order to invade Russia, he decided he, he, he needed a system to preserve food. So he had a contest. And a gentleman came up with a canning system using champagne bottles and a cork instead of uh, wax covers or whatever, seals. Yeah. So we have canned food today because of Napoleon, but it was developed to feed his army for the invasion of Russia. And he also took the old civilian logistical, uh, the civilian contractors, and turned them into veterans, to soldiers. He made them military and brought them under military command. That is a huge, huge, huge change from the system of warfare and i'm not talking brilliance on the battlefield because no matter how brilliant you are in the battlefield if you run out of bullets and beans you're going to lose yeah. and all of our warfare today is based on the evolution of the logistical system that napoleon introduced with his militarized soldiers running wagons now trucks bringing supplies to the front Mm, yeah, it's um, 
everything I've read about him seems to be that he was a ahead of his time in terms of you know his ability to grasp those concepts um and he seemed to have a mind that could concentrate on multiple challenges and problems at the same time without becoming flustered or forgetting anything well i don't think anybody will argue that he wasn't a genius but the genius went into more f fields than just the battlefield uh mm, just laws etc isn't it uh, code napoleon is the second largest legal system in the world mm, yeah yeah english english common law is number one and the code napoleon is number two more more countries have their law, legal systems based on that than the third, fourth, and fifth most common. It's a, it's an amazing how his um, his legacy lives on in in so many different ways. Um, you've you concentrated after um, after the Russia uh, campaign on the on the later campaigns with Leipzig, Lutzen and Bautzen, uh, Dresden, etc. What was the, the choice thinking of, of going down that line? There had been several books written on earlier campaigns and very little in recent history had been written on 1813 and 1814. So I said, oh, mm. there's a hole and I'm going to fill it. <laughs> Good man. Well, let, let me put it to you this way. How many books in the Battle of Waterloo exist and how many of you of them can you read? I mean, and why buy a, a 10th or a 12th book if you've read the previous nine yeah yeah i i quite i quite agree and and that was one of the great things about when your that series came out um was it, well wow this is uh, certainly being british uh, you know we tend to fixate on especially on waterloo and then on the peninsula um it's uh it was an it was something nice to see and opened up a, a different a different field if you like um, and and again was that that possible due to you know your accessing things from from multiple languages yes absolutely well let me ask you a a a, 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 a question and i already know the answer to that how many people do you know that speak <laughs> four languages uh, I mean, it, it, it's um, rhetorical. I mean, I, I, a lot of Englishmen speak yeah. uh, more than one language, but America, no. I, I had a skill set that exists only in academia, but I had the interest of a war gamer. And uh, mm. ha having accumulated an extremely large library, I had access to all the books. And now with, geez, uh, what you can find on the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale's website, if I had this back then, I could have done even more. And do you do you have somebody, or did you have somebody at the time who who did the maps for you? The original maps in 1812, I did myself. Uh, in mm. 1813, I don't remember those. 1814, I know those were done by somebody else. Uh, and the, the long story there that I won't go into, but uh, he redid them on a computer but i was sitting there with a uh, pen and paper and ruler and uh uh cutouts of uh little squares for the regiments and such and uh there there was a system uh available you could buy a, a transparent sticker that had trees and other stuff on them and you could cut that to the shape you wanted and put it on the paper so that's how those were done by yours truly huh. A lot of work again, in, and we've talked about the orders of battle, but there was a lot of work on on those as well, and a lot of um, detail in terms of numbers of officers and men, etc., in each unit that you could get. Is that what was the source for for all that information? Okay, first is Chateau Vincennes, the Army Archives. Mm -hmm. Second is the uh, National Archives in downtown Paris, uh, and and I found massive collections of orders of battle there because. They handled the payroll, ah, so they had they had copies of them, uh, and uh, they had the names of all of the officers and such. That's how I got that. Uh, for the other armies, multitude of sources, and sometimes you'll love this in the Leipzig Order battle, and I don't remember what exactly ended up in the book for the Allies, mm. uh, but. It showed the uh, 
Westphalian, I think it was Westphalians, uh, being at Leipzig. And it wasn't until I uh, started putting the book together that I found out that they had defected uh, a month before the Battle of Leipzig, so they weren't there. But the <laughs> book I'd found it from, the book I'd found the Order of Battle in, had them there. Well, I, I think I corrected that issue, but, uh, you know, you're only as good as your sources. And uh, my, my, well, another yeah. issue brought this up, but the German archives, uh, when I wrote them to try and track down some information, I got back, alles war abverbrannt. Everything was burned up. Doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. So mm -hmm. those records cannot be approached anymore. They're, they're gone. You, there may be some in some of the uh, uh, provincial capitals like Baden-Baden and uh, Munich or, well, not in Dresden, uh, but... Um, no, no, <laughs> we might be responsible for that. Yeah, well, we won't discuss that, will we? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <I know. laughs> but uh, so, so you have to depend on your sources, and uh, I saw hundreds of sources. Uh, I, I wouldn't be, well, if you look at the bibliography, that's where I found them, because I documented mm -hmm. where I found everything. Yeah, there's a, there's a huge load of, uh, of uh, sources in, in the back of, uh, years and years of reading, I would suggest, um, in the back of, the, of, of all of the books. It's amazing how much uh, work you put in to get all these uh, researched and, and, and finished and out to the world. Um, did you ever think about doing a, a war game book? No. Early, very early on, in 1975 or six, I had a set of war game rules published, and uh, communications between us were not good, and they kind of screwed it up and added their own appendices on how to organize things, which is not what I used, but that's another issue. Uh, and uh, I, I thought about a Napoleonic novel at one point, but that went nowhere. And uh, I, I, I've done some work on a couple of works that are economics and politics and so they have nothing to do with war gaming mm. uh and they're both in the draft uh unfinished form did you ever think about like a scenario book or something like that based on you know napoleon at leipzig or or one of the bouts and something like that as a yeah but isn't that what the book is <laughs> yeah but i it um, with lots of pretty pictures of soldiers, that sort of thing. A number of people have done it since. Well, yeah, but uh, I, I've not. I got to tell you, I haven't looked at anybody's works on 1812 or 1813 since mine came out. I just figured they would be citing me, quite frankly. Uh, and then, Lord knows where they would get whatever else they put in, but they must have found some sources. Uh, and I'm not attacking them. Don't misunderstand that. But uh, I've just I had no interest in reading anybody else's account of it. I think um, I think most people who've who have written scenario books um, will have used your books as their basis. I would suggest. Well, they should have because that's the absolute raw data. I mean, right out of the French archives. Yeah. So what's um, what's um, George Nafziger is like uh, Nafziger. We'll get it right. Um, working on at the moment. What's what are you doing now, George? Tell you what. Let me click something here so I can get to a file, and I will give you the. There is a book that was written in about seventeen uh, seventy or so by the Marquis de Silva. Uh, and let's see where I can find the exact title because I'm looking at my translation. It is <laughs> Pensée sur la tactique et sur quelques autres parties de la guerre. Thoughts on tactics and on other parts of warfare. Right now I'm sitting here bored out of my gourd looking at his uh, calculations for uh, firing oblique artillery into somebody's line. And let's just say that gets wow. tedious. Uh, it got to the point where it got to the point where I said, if I translate this and give it to somebody to read, they'll fall asleep at it. So I, I summarized it into a table real quick. Oh, good, good idea. What is that for Napoleonic's that that book? 
Sorry, no, was, it, 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 it's pre-Napoleonic. You did say the date, didn't you? Yeah, it's pre, yeah. pre-Napoleonic, post Seven Years' War. There are references to a lot of things in there. Uh, and, and there's some interesting things. It kind of is a precursor of uh, uh, the Ordre Mints and the Ordre uh, Profond uh, of the regulation of 1791 because uh, he's mm. talking about attack columns and shock. Uh, although he's got his own funny ideas about six, six, rank, no, about uh, longer muskets in the rear ranks, so that you presented a hedgerow of uh, pikes, except they're muskets. Oh, wow, that's a good idea. Well, I don't know. Uh, it, it wasn't adopted, so it may not have been that good an idea. <laughs> but uh, 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 yeah, Some, sometimes people have uh, innovative ideas that sound good. Um, and then somebody else says, no, maybe it won't work. Well, it, it was never adopted, but th- th- I've seen some, some twinklings of some things that certainly appeared during the Napoleonic period. Uh, mm. So, uh, and the, the firing enfilade uh, or obliquely, uh, you know, it, it certainly makes good sense. And now I don't know how many people, when the two lines came up, turned their cannons inward so that they're firing at the opposite end of the enemy's line so that he can travel through a greater depth of men. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, it, it certainly makes good logical sense. And uh, well, there, there are a few other odds and ends in there that don't come to mind off the top of my head. But uh, And this is a bit of a slog because he is a Spaniard who was working in the, he was work as a general in the Piedmontese army writing in French. And this is before French was really totally standardized, so it, it's got some interesting problems. My, my, my linguistic skills are being stretched to the limit. Are there, are there lots of books out there like this that are just waiting to be uh, translated? Oh, Lord, yes. I've got a collection of PDFs that are on my... Uh, someday, if I live long enough, I'll get to translating this. But uh, I have... Uh, recently translated Quincy's uh, The Wars of Louis the Great, uh, basically mm. Louis the Fourteenth, And that was seven very large volumes, and it came to uh, 24 volumes in, in the format that I produce. And a separate section, which I kept separate, which was how warfare was done in that period, and it's an interesting mm. work. And then I got Pajol's the Wars of Louis the Fifteenth, and I have translated the first six volumes of that, and that's in twenty volumes. And the last volume is yet to be—it's uh, been edited. I just haven't put the editings into the manuscript yet, and that won't be long. Mm. And the last volume of that—I'm not sure what I'm going to do with that. It's uh, every unit that existed in the French army during the Seven Years' War, including all the independent little uh, light infantry companies you know the oh uh fisher's legion and that Mm. sort of stuff or fisher's corps and uh so on so and it's interesting uh in seeing as i've gone through pajol uh how the uh suddenly you start seeing the uh volunteers of hainal and the volunteer de flandre and all these other little uh light infantry or units or legions starting to appear because you can see the uh, uh, influence of the uh, Mm. Hungarians coming over and getting involved and the French saying, hey, this is a good idea. And and again, this is leading again towards what eventually became a major element of Napoleon's warfare, the skirmish warfare then. But uh, after uh, De Silva, Lord knows what I'm going to get into. It depends on which way the wind blows my skirts. There's, well, there's plenty, there's plenty going on there. And are these uh, are these translations available um, as what books or downloads or uh, how, how do you only in paper? They're only available in paper through my website. And oh, I, I need to add something since I take it a lot of uh, Europeans are going to be listening to this. Uh, my website yeah. will not handle the postage issues for shipping to Europe, so you can get my email address off my website or off the PDF uh, that I gave you. I believe it's on there and you can email me and tell me what you yep. want after you've gone through my website and seen the uh, various things. And um, I will 
pack them up and go to the post office and get your quote on the postage. That's the way we have to do overseas. That's fantastic. Stuff. I'll, 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 I'll make sure I, um, I put your email on the, please um, do have like a little, I think I'll show notes that we put at the end. I'll, put us text to go with the recording and i'll put that on there to make sure that people um can get hold of you um and um as i said earlier on um george's books have been a a major influence on my wargaming and if you haven't got any copies um please get in contact with george and uh, get hold of uh, many many books on many many periods uh, you've you've uh, you've been a busy boy mate <laughs> Hey, I got nothing that better to do uh, other than get in trouble. And, and as far as my wife's concerned, it beats going down to the bar and getting drunk or chasing loose women. So <sighs> I've been a good boy. That's that. That's exactly that's exactly what my wife says. That <laughs> when I'm painting I think soldiers, that's what, I'm not chasing loose women. So uh, uh, we're in a club there, George. I think that's what all wives say. But anyway. I was just going to say, George, it's been it's been a wonderful um, couple of hours talking to you, and I'm so glad that we we had this opportunity to have a chat. Um, and I'd just like to thank you for the time uh, coming on. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Well, thank you, and the pleasure was all mine. And uh, nice meeting you. And uh, hope we keep in touch. Def definitely, George. And at the end of the show, I always uh, say good night to the audience. So if you'd like to say good night. Well, as we say in the Southern Ohio, good night, y'all. <laughs> Thanks very much, George. Well, there we go. I hope you enjoyed that uh, interview as much as I did uh, with George Nafsiger. And uh, I hope the edit that I've managed to get together uh, all made sense and all flowed nicely. There was, uh, as I said earlier on in the intro, a lot of issues uh, technically. And it's a real shame because I, I would have liked to have talked with George a little bit more about uh, a few other things. But uh, I think uh, the finished product I've managed to get out is uh, is a good one. So I hope you've enjoyed it. And thanks once again to George for taking part. Please bob along to his website. There'll be a link to that wherever you're listening to this, either on the uh, Podbean audio version or on the YouTube uh, visual version. And uh, get yourself some of his books if you haven't got them already. Uh, they are highly recommended by Yorkshire Gamer, especially if you're starting a project. Those orders of battle are absolutely fundamental for a planning of a historically based army list. And uh, I've been using them since I started wargaming, so uh, highly recommended from me. So uh, that just leads me on very quickly to my next guest, and I very much hope to be speaking to Paul Thompson of Early War Miniatures in my next episode. Uh, I very much admired the figures and vehicles that Early War Miniatures have done for a long time. I think the quality on them is absolutely superb. And one of the joys of doing this podcast and not having any sponsors or not being tied to any particular thing is that I get to the speak speak to the, speak to the people I want to speak to and um, I had a chat with Paul at the York show earlier in the year and uh, what a friendly lovely guy he is and uh, I'm looking forward to having him on the show so hopefully that'll be out in two or three weeks time uh, until then see thee. <laughs>